he just came right over, beelined. And he goes, what are you doing here? I thought you were going to be a priest. This is my territory. And the girls flipped out. I saw a man levitate off the couch as I was praying over him. And that um, ended abruptly because I said, we're not having this. And they do a ritual, a blood ritual with the baby, which often involves a sexual practice with the baby as well. And they consecrate the baby to the devil for power. It took a year to get that demon out of her. But she was satanic ritually abused as a baby. I can't believe it got made because he's actually giving away a lot of the secrets of the, of the enemy, the, of the devil. And it's just like, how, how did Hollywood ever approve this? Greetings, everybody. Welcome to Catholic Talk. I'm delighted to be joined today by Father Dan Rehill, who is an exorcist priest at the St. Catherine of Siena Church in Columbia, Tennessee, in the USA. Thank you for being with me, Father Dan. Happy to be here. Good afternoon to you and all your listeners. Thank you so much. Um, Father Dan, I want to start by asking you um, about your journey to the church. If you could sort of tell me and the viewers a bit about what your life was like before that, and then what actually made you convert to Catholicism or revert to whatever it is, and then become a priest after that? Okay, well, I actually was uh, baptized uh, when I was three weeks old on the feast of the beheading of John the Baptist, August 29th, 1965. So I, I came to the church almost immediately, and of course, you don't know you're part of the church, so you kind of grow up and, and learn what's happening. So, um, you know, always went to church with my family, you know, a devout family. Um, but I, I sadly came across a priest who was sort of a predator. And uh, I was abused by this person. And I decided at a young age, I would I did not want to go back to the church ever. And so at the age of about 10, I decided I was done with the church. And I wanted to pursue becoming powerful because in my mind, the more power you had, the less chances somebody could hurt you. Right. So that's what I set out to do. So I physically went to the gym and worked out, uh, became big muscular and then financially went into back into New York city after college and started staking out a claim working on wall street. And I did that for uh, about a dozen years or so. And, um, I kind of achieved everything I wanted in life, but I was very unhappy and I couldn't really, I couldn't really understand why was I unhappy if I have everything that I really wanted. Right. So the, the lavish lifestyle, um, the fancy vacations, all of it. And what I didn't understand is that if you don't have God, you, you, your soul cannot be happy. It just is impossible because we're all made for God. And so without God, I was miserable. So I was having these nightmares every night. And um, after about a month or two of this, um, a friend had mentioned she's going to uh, this place in Bosnia, Herzegovina called Medjugorje. And she wanted me to come with her. And and I at the, at the time I was renting a villa in Amalfi, which is just, you know, kind of right across the Adriatic there. Um, and so I thought, yeah, this would be just like Italy, you know, good food, good wine. It'll be a fun vacation, vacation, <laughs> not pilgrimage. And when I got there, I realized almost immediately that I did not fit in there because it was mostly older women praying the rosary. So I was very tired and decided I would go, uh, call it a day, go to bed and in the morning, figure out how to get out of there. But I woke up the next morning with this completely new feeling of peace, a peace that I'd never felt ever before. And I kind of all the stress and anxiety of my life was all gone. And I thought, this is so weird, but it, I like this. I want to, I want this to continue. So I'm going to stay. And I knew enough from my Catholic upbringing as a child that I had to go to confession because it'd been 20 plus years since I'd been to confession. And I knew, I mean, I knew what my sins were. I mean, I think I didn't care at the time, but I knew what they were. So I, I knew it would have to be a priest. I, in my mind, I had to find a priest that wasn't going to be too judgmental 
And so I made my way over to the church and there was this priest outside um, telling jokes to a bunch of women and smoking a cigarette. And he looked like the Hollywood priest. I said, this will be the right priest. So I said to him, can, can you hear my confession? He said, of course. And he heard my confession. And then at the end of the confession, he absolved me. And then he said, I think you have a vocation to be a priest. And I said, why do you say that? That's, did you hear my confession? It was, that's not a priest's life that I just confessed. And he said, all things are possible with God. And that was kind of the end of it. So that's what got me back to the church. When I got back to New York City, I had to change a lot of my life had to be changed, right? I had to kind of get rid of a whole set of friends that were not healthy. I joined the Wall Street Young Catholics Association to make new friends of guys that would be healthy uh, people around uh, to be with. And um, within about two months, I was living the messages of Magic Warriors. So I'm going to I'm going to daily mass. And I'm going to confession every month. I'm fasting on Fridays and occasionally on Wednesdays, uh, praying every day, the rosary. And that got me on the trajectory that God really, I guess, was waiting for me to, to get back to. But then uh, it wasn't too much. Well, I got a spiritual director by, by chance, this little old priest noticed me coming to mass every day and said, I haven't seen you here before. What's your, what's your story? And I told him my story and he said, Oh, well, I think you need a director because it seems like God's doing something with you. I said, that's fine. I don't know how that works, but we can do it. And the first thing he said was, you have to start praying every day, asking God if he wants you to do something different with your life. And I said, okay, just like that. God, do you want me to do something different with my life? He's like, yeah. I go, okay, that takes five seconds. I can do that. And uh, I prayed it every day, and I never heard anything back. Um, so after like a week of this, I went back to him and said, um, God didn't answer me, so I guess he wants me to stay in this business. And he said, well, hold on a second. Um, let's recap. So you left the church for over 20 years, and you ignored God in your life, and you pursued the world – and then you prayed for seven days and he didn't answer you. Is that correct? Is that what you're telling me? And he said, yes. When you put it like that, it sounds kind of stupid, right? He goes, because it is stupid. Keep praying. So I did this for 18 months. And then on November 5th of 2000, right after I received communion, it was a Sunday mass. Um, I went back to my pew and uh, it was early in the morning. And I heard a voice say, come follow me. And it was audible. I heard it outside my head. I turned around to see who was saying it. There was nobody near me. And then it, I kind of realized, oh, this is you. you. You, you're answering me. So I called in sick Monday and prayed about it. Tuesday, I resigned, and that was the beginning of pursuing priesthood, which I'm still kind of rough around the edges because it's been a short time since my conversion. I'm, there's still a lot of the world in me. So my initial response was I have to get put up spreadsheets and analyze all the religious orders and their charisms and where they're located. And most importantly, how long does it take to become a priest? Because I was in a hurry as I'm my whole life is like this, right? Just get to the get to the goal quick. So, you know, Dominicans 12 years off the list, Jesuits 12 years off the list, Legionnaires of Christ 12 years off the list. And when I realized diocesan priesthood is really the shortest path, it could be four years if you already have an undergraduate, um, that's the path I pursued. So I went to my um, my diocese, the, the diocesan offices and asked if, the, if there was a priest in charge of vocations. And the secretary said, yes, of course, he's actually here today. Just hold on a second. And, oh, go, go ahead in. And I walked in and it was the pre, I had been married previously in the church because it's what both our parents wanted. Um, and this was the priest that prepared me and married me or witnessed the marriage. And when I walked through the door and he heard somebody here to inquire about becoming a priest, he looked at me and he said, no, no, you are not called to be a priest. Get out. And he was very bitter about the fact that the marriage did, didn't work out, I guess. Um, and he thought I just probably had no vocation in life. I don't know. But I was like, okay, good. I really didn't want to be Dawson anyway. So off the list. 
Uh, but I'm continuous. So I start setting up these appointments, you know, flying into these cities, meeting with these uh, religious orders. And they keep just shutting me down like, nope, we don't want you. So I go back to the little priest who's directed me, the little Polish priest, and I, I start telling him, like, nobody, they don't want me at all. Like, they're very put off by me. And he goes, well, what happens? Tell me what happens when you arrive. And I said, well, I go, we sit down in the office, we begin the meeting, and then I start asking them questions about their order and, you know, um, you know, their charism and uh, the process and all this. And... Um, and then by the time I'm done, they kind of just say, no, we're not interested. And he goes, so they didn't ask you any questions. I said, no. He goes, are you interviewing them? They said, yeah. He goes, no, that's not how this works. They interview you. They're choosing you. You don't get to choose them. So you have to go back. This is going forward. You, you don't – you go there humbly asking to know – about what they want from you. And so that changed that. Um, uh, and by the time all this happens, uh, nine 11 happened and my apartment. was about four blocks from the trade center. So I am now, now not only am I jobless, now I'm homeless. And this priest from Boston came down to do a mass, a healing mass for all the widows of that day. And one of my friends uh, perished that day who worked for Cantor Fitzgerald's and his wife asked if uh, I could take her to the mass. So we did. And I met the priest and he said to me, you know, what are you doing with your life? And I said, nothing. I have nothing going on right now. And he said, well, maybe you're supposed to be in Boston. And he walked away. And, uh, you know, my track record with priests, it was still in the near distant memory of like, don't trust priests. So I'm like, ah, this weird priest invited me to come stay with him in Boston. But, you know, I'm still very cautious. And uh, my parents had said to me, you know, well, how was the mass? I said, it was good. But, you know, the priest was a little weird. And they said, why? And I said, well, he said maybe I'm supposed to go to Boston. And my mom said, did you pray about it? And I said, no. And she goes, well, you don't really have anything going on. Maybe you should pray about it. So I did. Um, the Lord said, go up. I went to go for a weekend just to check it out. And I went up staying up there for nine months and he turned out to be probably the holiest priest I've met ever. And he was just such a good man. He had the heart of Jesus. He prayed intensely and he sat two hours every day before the Eucharist with the Bible open, reading through the scriptures and just absorbing the whole message of God. And that was really the beginning of my formation was there. That was it. And he really brought me up to speed with all things churchy, you know, like how to serve at a mass, um, how to pray the office of readings. He bought me my first set of breveries, all that stuff that you would probably get at seminary. He, I got there, but I also got there, um, is this, um, deep love for Jesus that he had. And this deep love he had for people, it was both Jesus and the people. And he was very good with the homeless and um, the poor. And so that was, that was, that was probably the most dynamic formation I had. Uh, certainly I, that was the beginning, but it, even after I would compare it better, it was better than seminary in many regards. And from there, he said, go to Holy Apostles Seminary in Connecticut, because you don't need a diocese to sponsor. You can just go and get your philosophy done. I didn't take philosophy in college because in the eighties who, who did, I don't think anybody did. Uh, but you have to have that to be a priest. So I had to do a year of philosophy. I went, got it done. Uh, and then by then I got picked up by a diocese in New York and I started my theological training at that point. And so that's kind of how I got back in. Now I recall, um, in another interview that I saw you give, you mentioned, I think it was before you were a priest, that you had a couple of occasions where you had encounters with who you say was the devil. Um, I thought that was very interesting. Uh -huh. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about those. Yeah, twice. Um, same guy, by the way. So, you know, when people hear this, they go, well, how do you know it was the devil? I go, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but... It wasn't a possessed person, that's for sure. I know what possessed people are like, and it wasn't that. Um, 
so once I was coming out of spiritual direction with the little Polish priest at Our Lady of Victory in Chase Manhattan Plaza, downtown Manhattan, and it's it's morning still. It's probably 1030 in the morning. I come out and there's this guy standing there, just standing on the sidewalk, staring at me coming through the door. And it's unusual. In New York, people are always moving. It's a hustle and bustle city, especially down there. Um, it's still morning. The market's open. Everybody's working. And here's this very, very, very handsomely dressed custom suit guy, beautiful face, like be, doesn't even look like a human almost. He's so uh, central casting, beautiful guy. So as I turn and start walking away, he comes up next to me and grabs me by the arm. And he goes, now right before this, I was complaining to the spiritual director that it's very difficult trying to balance the work life with this becoming a good Catholic life. Because my job entailed me to, to be taking out people, uh, entertaining them at night, clients and things. So it's late nights, a lot of drinking, um, schmoozing with people. And he said, well, for the next month, just don't drink any alcohol. You go early and just tell the bartender when you order a, a vodka soda to put no vodka in it. If they really, because the thing is, that they want you drinking with them. It's a very male bonding thing to when the client is taken out by the. It's weird, but it, it's a it's a real thing anyway. So after this discussion, I come out the doors and there's this guy, right? So he grabs my arm and he goes, "Let's go get a drink." And I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" Like. Did he hear this conversation? This is so weird. And I'm like, get away from me. And he didn't get away from me. He let go of my arm, but he followed me. And I, at this point, I wasn't going back to work. I, I made a beeline for my apartment because it was closer. And I get to the doors and I go through the doors and I turn back around and he's just staring at me laughing. It was like a mocking, you know, and I'll never forget it. And so he eventually he leaves and then I run back to the church and tell the priest and I go, what, what do you think? And he goes, well, I told you, you're going to have a bullseye on your back and, and the devil's going to hate that you're leaving this life for this life. So you just don't be afraid. Just be aware. And I said, well, when you said there'll be a bullseye on your back, I wasn't thinking there'd be like the, the devil's going to show up in front of the church and try to get me to go to a bar with. That's weird. He's like, yeah, but, you know, like, don't make too much out of it. Just move on. So then a couple of years later, I'm on a break from seminary, and one of my old colleagues is, is down now in Miami working, you know, the I guess the Latin American market or whatever. And I go down to visit with another friend, and we go to this very fancy kind of um, boutique beach bar restaurant that's outdoors on the ocean. Very exclusive. And uh, right away, the, the two women are – looking towards the edge of the, the deck and they're like staring at this guy and they're like ooing and eyeing over how handsome he is. And I'm, my back is to him, so I can't see who it is. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh my gosh, he's coming over here. And, uh, he walks up to the table and there he is, same guy. And he looks right at me. And meanwhile, we haven't had any conversation with this guy. He just came right over beelined and he goes, what are you doing here? I thought you were going to be a priest. This is my territory. And the girls flipped out. Like they instantly had like the spidey senses go off, like danger, danger, danger. And the one of them's just like, we got to go. And they're like, grab the bill. We're going to pay on the way out. We got to get out of here. And we leave. And they were just like, what, who was that? You know, how did he know who you were? And how did he, how did he know you were in seminary? And what did he mean? This is my territory. And I said, I don't know, but I met him a few years ago on down by Wall Street, he wanted to get a drink one day, and I think it's the same guy, and I'm pretty sure it's he's not a human. He's just appearing as one, and they were just like, what? Um, I haven't seen him again. I've come up against him in exorcisms, but not in physical form, like whatever that was. But uh, yeah, it was it was pretty creepy at the time. Yeah, I think just, just particularly that second time when you when he came up to you and you said, when you meant to be a priest, you're thinking, you've never spoken to him about this. What's going on? This is crazy, right? No. Mm -mm. No. Nope. Um, okay, so how did it actually happen that you became an exorcist then? 
Well, that's and that's an interesting story too. So, uh, two years into my theology degree at seminary, I left the seminary because I was very unhappy with that seminary, that particular seminary. I thought it, I thought the teaching was uh, heretical, and I'm like, I don't want to be formed or misformed or deformed by this group. So I left, and I went up joining a religious order of contemplative hermits in the middle of the woods. There was about 80 of us. And the superior over the men was the exorcist for Omaha. And so we have a lot of people coming in from all over the world, literally, who are sending their possessed people who, I guess they couldn't drive the demon out wherever they're coming from. And so this was sort of like the last call, send them to Omaha. And so that was my first experience of that whole well, Father Tom did deliverance too, so that was really my first experience. But then this is now formal exorcisms um, and a lot of deliverance and a lot of healing. They all go together. It's like two sides of a coin. And um, I was there five years and witnessed and learned a lot of the techniques from, from him and from the community. And then I went back to a different seminary to finish and I get ordained in Nashville, and that bishop knew about this religious group and what they do, their charism of the deliverance. So he said to me and another priest that was also from that community, would you be open to taking all the cases for this diocese for the deliverance? And we said, sure, you know, we'll do it. Um, he did not make us an exorcist. He thought giving someone, making someone an exorcist would be too much of a burden on one person. It was his own theory. So we did, and then that priest went back to Omaha after two years, and, and I was the only one doing it. So then that bishop died, and then I am under his umbrella of protection as, the, as someone doing deliverance for the diocese. So when he died, I stopped doing it, and I would tell the priests, I can't do this until I have a bishop that puts me under his protection. So when the new bishop comes and is installed, right away he's getting all these phone calls from priests saying, can you send Father Rehill to us? We need help. So he finally calls and says, well, why is everybody asking for you to come help them? I said, oh, I do the deliverance for the diocese. You know, but we, I, I've been, I haven't been doing it because I've been waiting for a bishop to come and, and put me under his protection. And he said, are you the exorcist? And I said, no, I'm not. And I told him the reasons why the former bishop didn't, didn't want to do it. And he said, well, I kind of feel differently. I feel like you're fighting with your hands tied behind your back. Go to Rome and become an exorcist. So I did. He went over, got formally trained, sent back. And then he, what happens is the bishop then formally delegates you this authority to, to drive out demons and do exorcisms. And so that's how that came about. Mm -hmm. And was there any point when you could see that that was a kind of, the area you were going into, was there any time where you thought, actually, you're not sure you want to, you want to do this? Because it's quite a serious thing. Um, no. I mean, I felt like I'd already seen quite a bit um, and done, you know, up to the point, but not crossing the line to an actual rite of exorcism. I think when you go to Rome, though, and you start seeing case studies and videos of, you know, prior exorcisms that they, they're teaching us and what to do and what not to do when you're learning what not to do that that's a little daunting because you're like oh wow i probably would have done that if they didn't tell me don't do that mm. <laughs> you know like don't touch anything that's vomited out of a person now you know most people aren't going to play in somebody's vomit but if they vomit out nails or they vomit out frogs or they're vomiting out, you know, material objects, don't touch the object because it's probably cursed and it has to be – that has to be delivered before anybody touches it to clean it up or, you know, wrangle them out of the room or whatever. So it's all that sort of stuff where, like, you don't know what you don't know until you find out you know it because they teach you it. It's like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. There's a lot of that that goes on. And it's not just you. It's like there was a large class of priests. And we're all looking at each other like, did anybody here know that? Like, no, nobody knew that. So that's – that was but – but at the same time, you're very thankful to, to then know this is the proper way to handle this. And you're like, okay, good. That's another, you know, weapon for my arsenal. Yeah. Um, how many exorcisms would you say you've done? Do you know the exact number? It's not very many. I would say maybe 10 mm -hmm. in three years. 
And would you be you able know, it's to- longer than three years? It's been, uh, gosh, it's been six years. Mm-hmm. So it's probably about three or four a year for six years. Three or four per year. Per okay, year for six years. Okay, so that's like twenty or so now, close to that. Yeah, but it, it, they're far and few between. To be honest, most of this stuff can be handled with lesser things. You know, mm-hmm. so if you're Catholic and you're not fully possessed, but you've got a demon that's harassing you because you've opened some kind of a door to it, just going to confession breaks so many of these things off the person. So many. Then if you give them a prayer routine to stick to, you know, every day pray the rosary, every day pray Psalm 91, every day read the first chapter of the Gospel of John, that also has a tremendous impact on on keeping them, getting them off and keeping them off. And living a sacramental life is tremendous. I mean, they don't like that. So they don't want to really be around people who are doing that. The problem in Tennessee is we're only 3% Catholic. So the vast majority of the cases I see are not Catholics. They can't go to confession. They can't go to communion. And it makes it more difficult. Mm-hmm. Would you be able to give me and the viewers, the viewers and me, uh, a description of one or two of the kind of more severe exorcisms that you had to deal with? What kind of what happened? What, what, what the problem was and then what happened during it? Well, I'd say the strangest thing is one, I saw a man levitate off the couch as I was praying over him. And that um, ended abruptly because I said, we're not having this. I was not in a church at the time. And you really should be on your territory, not theirs. And so that was the end of that. And I said, nope. It was the first time I met the guy. He was in sort of a halfway house. He had other issues. And then as soon as I saw that, I'm like, no, you're going to have to come see me at the church where... I have the upper hand and that was over. Um, and the other, you know, oftentimes they, they, they know things, they know things they shouldn't know about you, you know, just randomly they'll, and that's always a little weird when they can, you know, first time you meet a stranger and they can tell you stuff about your life and you're like, Hmm, wonder how they know that. Or I had a guy who was pretty bad off. He was, he was possessed and he was living sort of in a shelter with other guys. Uh, he didn't have a car. He lost his car, his girlfriend, his job, his family, everything. And so I would say to him, I'm going to come see you tomorrow at some time in the middle of the day, but I wouldn't give him an exact time because he's home all day anyway. So it really doesn't matter. Uh, and I noticed when I would turn the corner, he would be out waiting for me at the curb. And so the first time this happened, I said, have you been standing out here all day? And he goes, no, I just came out. And I go, how did you know I was coming? And he goes, they know, because they get really agitated when you're about a block or two away. And that's when I know you're close. And then I come out. I said, oh, okay. Again, you know, the, the supernatural world um, operates at, with different parameters. They don't have to hear from you. They just know because they can see. It's almost like a bird's eye view of what's happening and they can sense when you're coming. So that stuff. I'll tell you the most authentic um, movie I've seen about real life possession is that new movie, Nefarious. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it yet, no. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. That is so real. Um, The fact that they, they can jump from one person to another not to make people afraid. Um, it's people that are opening themselves up to these spirits. But I, that happens to me all the time where one specific spirit, I'll have three cases in a month of the same affliction. And I start to think, why is this all happening right now? They're all the same thing. And uh, it's because sometimes the, the fascination isn't just the people. They're, they're kind of circling around you as well. And if you watch that movie, that's kind of, they depict that very well. Mm-hmm. So you'd say like if somebody, because obviously there's a lot of exorcism movies, if someone was going to pick one, if you were going to pick one to watch that's closest to how it actually happens. That, that's the one. that movie is 100% dead on. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, the f- I can't believe it got made because he's actually giving away a lot of the secrets of the of the enemy, the, of the devil. And it's just like, how, how did Hollywood ever approve this, given that they're probably mostly in that camp. Mm -hmm. Um, the exorcist movie is really a bunch of baloney. 
Okay. Like all that stuff that happened would never happen in one case. That it would be so everything off the charts, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, the real case that that movie was supposed to be based on was a boy. It wasn't even a girl. So all that girl problem issues weren't even, they made all that up. It was all made up. Uh, and in the end of the real case, both the priests were fine. Nobody died. Nobody was murdered by the demon. So they took so many liberties with that movie and made it Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So that's not real. First of all, we do not go to a strange house in the middle of the night during a thunderstorm to do an exorcism. No decent priest would do that. You know, it's daytime. We've celebrated mass. We've prepared. You're coming to my church in the chapel under controlled circumstances with another priest and a group of intercessors praying behind the scenes. Nobody would go to a big old haunted mansion on a thunderstorm night at midnight to do an exorcism. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, one of the things that I uh, wanted to ask you about was, because obviously people can get possessed, they kind of open themselves up to, to things. Can people also get possessed because of something that was done to them, but is it almost like not their fault, and then that's caused yes. them to be possessed? Yeah, mm -hmm. sadly, yes. Mm -hmm. So, same principle as baptism of a baby. The baby doesn't give the consent, the parents give the consent, right? But the baby's getting baptized. You can do that with evil as well. And so there's what we would call satanic ritual abuse, SRA victims. Um, sadly, there are people out there, you know, who are in these occult families who may be a grandparent when they are babysitting the baby, take the baby and they do a ritual, a blood ritual with the baby, which often involves a sexual practice with the baby as well. And they consecrate the baby to the devil for power, for power, for money and power. And that poor child grows up not knowing why it's so messed up, but you know, the grandparent knows. And eventually if they make their way to a good exorcist team, you know, we can see the signs and, and go back in history. And if we can, we just had a case, not just, but back when I was in that group in, in the, uh, the hermits, we had a, a nun uh, from a very well-known religious order uh, who they flew her over from Rome and she stayed with us a year. It took a year to get that demon out of her, but she was satanic ritually abused as a baby. And eventually, um, we got the mother to confirm that. And that's when the big breakthrough started happening. When we went back to her being a, a baby, of course she didn't remember, but we took her back through a series of meditations about God creating her and forming her uh, to be a child of God. And uh, boy, when we took her through that, the demon just went crazy. He did not want to hear that. And eventually, then the exorcist just said, "Now leave. You have no, you have no control here. She is no longer in your domain." And he did leave, but it took a year mm -hmm. of affirming her in her identity because she really believed she was evil mm -hmm. because of her whole life of doing terrible things, which she really didn't have control over. Mm -hmm. So yes, it can happen. It's a very sad fact of life. Um, I, I tell parents all the time protect your children like if you don't know the person well don't let your kids be left with anybody that you don't know well and in this case it would be even a grandparent but if your grandparents are into some weird stuff well, they go off in the woods once a month and do weird things like don't give your kids to them how easy is it to um to kind of open yourself up to because obviously people talk about things like you know, Ouija boards and various occult practices or dark kind of things that people are getting into. Can you draw evil to you even just by basic sins, just sort of things that you don't think much of, but already that's somehow drawing yep. it closer? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, drug abuse. Um, sometimes there's a curse on the drugs, so there's demons attached to the drugs mm. so that the the person who buys the drugs gets an instant addiction and has to keep going back to buy more. It's not just a natural addiction. It's a, it's a spiritual addiction. Um, sex, you know, especially odd sexual practices and outside of marriage. Um, pretty much every way you can sin in a capital sin offense. So wrath, murder, all these things would be open doors. 
<clears throat> my concern right now, the biggest concern I have in 2023, is this new artificial intelligence um, websites and and uh, platforms, because <clears throat> I'm not convinced it's all the programmer that's responding to the people, because in several instances, people who've gone on, even the New York Times reporter, uh, was instantly plagued with nightmares, night terrors, despair, uh, feelings of suicide. And they're like, this isn't me. What is going on? And it was right after they went on one of these, this particular person went on to do a story for the paper, uh, said he would never go back. And now there's artificial intelligence saying they're going to write their own Bible because they have a better Bible they want to give to the world. So that people who are looking for, you know, kind of the supernatural element out there. And it's the kids. They're all looking for stuff, right? They don't know what they're really looking for is God. And so instead they're looking for all the, the anti-God stuff, but they're, for the most part, you know, victims, innocent victims who just stumble into something and then they don't know they're putting their head in a lion's mouth, but the lion knows. So very dangerous. Um, I was also going to ask about some um, manifestations. Uh, when we talked about those two incidents that you, you know, say could well have been the devil, in that first one, he grabs you by the arm. He's, he's basically like a person. Is that something the devil can do? Can he become, you know, physically human or some kind of physical creature and actually touch somebody physically or something like that? Um, yes. Now, it's not common, but <clears throat> we know from uh, this, many of the saints, St. Pio, uh, St. John Vianney, that they were physically beaten up by the devil at night. He would come and, and physically beat them, where they'd be lying on the floor in a heap by the morning. Um, but he's not going to do that with most of the world's population, because you'd have to be at a level of, of sanctity, of holiness, that that's the only way he can bother you. Now, that would be great if everybody was that holy, but those people at that level, they don't even care because they know the devil's attacks are meaningless and they can actually use them by uniting their sufferings to the cross to save more souls. So they, they you can't lose. Jesus has set up the cross to be the ultimate super weapon that no matter what the devil wields at you, if you just unite it to Jesus and send it back, it, he goes out and, and rescues more people. So... But the, the trick is the devil is often picking on people who don't know that. And so they're just getting beaten up and suffering, right? Most of the people who get possessed don't know this. They're all just suffering. Uh, but that's that's not what people should be worried about. People have to be worried about the real enemy uh, weapon is sin. Even if you get possessed by the devil, that can't get you to hell. You have to give up your will uh, and you can't do that. The devil can't take your will. He can only take your body and he can make your body do things you don't want it to do. But if you don't want it to do, you're not responsible for it, you know, in a way. But if you sin, which is the 99% of his tactic is to get you to sin, like in the garden with Adam and Eve, first sin we have, that's the classic, right? And that's what we have to be afraid of because that's what separates us from God. So again, if you want to avoid any problems with any kind of demonic entities. And it's not a hundred percent, you know, foolproof, but you're living your best life by being a very good practicing Catholic, loving God, loving your neighbor. I want to touch on symbolism briefly, because I also remember in another interview, you uh, mentioned, uh, for example, the logo of, Apple is a bitten apple. Uh, most people these days have an iPhone. Uh, if we look at Pride, for example, in June, all Pride events, they use the rainbow. Is that all showing us who's behind this? Is that all kind of like the devil's way of mocking us or almost like leaving his kind of personal ID on there in a way? Uh, I would say yes. I mean, I'm not saying that the Apple founders... I don't know why they chose that image. It's an odd thing, to be honest. It's a it's a computer. Why would you? What does it have to do with an Apple, especially one with a bite out of it? So, it is a little odd. I I wish we could ask them what what was the you know, impetus for this logo, but I don't. I guess nobody has. Um, but yeah, you know, the devil lately is not concerned about being seen. 
Um, he used to be very cloak and dagger, you know, hidden. And the big tactic was to get everyone to believe there is no devil. Well, nowadays, I think it, people pretty much would agree there's definitely a demonic force at work in the world. And there's a lot of things happening in the world that are the calling card of Satan. So his calling cards are public nudity, division, and violence, right? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But if you look at the Gerasene demoniac in the Bible, he was naked in chains, busting out of his chains, uh, charging through the tombs, wreaking havoc. That's the three calling cards. So look at the world today. Public nudity, violence, division. Probably an all-time high. So he's not afraid of letting himself be seen anymore, which means to me, his days are numbered and he knows it. And so now it's like cornering a rabid animal. They're just flailing at everybody. Yep. That leads me on to basically the next thing I was going to ask you about. Do you think, given how obvious certain things seem to be, um, given how, you know, Sister Lucia was supposed to have said that his final attack is going to be on the family and it seems mm -hmm. to be happening now that it really is a case of he's just like, he knows that the end is 100%. Here. Yeah, and you know, in correlation to that, we have in this place, you know, over but closer to you, Medjugorje, I would say, you know, after the celebration of the Mass, that's probably the greatest thing that's happening in the world today. When did the Mother of God ever come down to earth every day for 41 years to give a message of conversion to all of God's children. And it's all of them. She wants everybody to come into the embrace of her son, which it's in my mind, it's, it, she's saying prayer, confession, the Eucharist, fasting, um, and one other. Well, to do two of those, you have to be a Catholic. So I feel like she's calling the whole world to come into the church which is like the, the, the ark right now. It's the new ark. I think there's, there's a new flood coming of things that are going to be very difficult, and she's trying to gather everybody into her son's church uh, for you know the more primary purpose we, we come to church is to worship God, but also for her. And I feel like you know her... Her immaculate heart will triumph eventually. She's going. She's been given the authority to crush Satan. Um, I'm hoping it's in our lifetime. And if that's so, we're looking at a future that's going to be so incredible, so different than anything we've ever seen. Because we saw in the first 2,000 years of God revealing himself, it was really all about God the Father, you know, with the Israelites and all. And then his son comes, and we have, we've had 2,000 years of the son Jesus and I have to believe there's going to be a period for the Holy Spirit. And when that comes, like, imagine everybody moving in God's divine will at once. It literally will be heaven on earth. That'll be something to see, won't it? Yay! <laughs> Absolutely. Father Dan, thank you very much for your time. I've got no more questions for you. I really appreciate the chat. It was very insightful. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you again. Let me give you my blessing. Yes. To you and all your viewers, may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank God you bless you. Have Father. a great day. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.